of course, it's been a real honor to be here, and I'm sort of humbled because I don't know really, you know, enough math to talk to the mathematicians, and I'm not a traditional statistician, and most often my audience is biologists, so I feel, um, you know, that you were very patient to come even to my last talk and um, go on listening to what I have to say. You were part of an experiment I tried for the different backgrounds. This is the one, um, this is the last day one, which is the blackboard background, and it goes well with the blackboard, so um, maybe that will be okay. And today I'm going to talk about hidden variables in the microbiome, and I just want to say some of you had to miss uh, one or two of the lectures, and I talked before about heterogeneity, um, propagation and visualization of uncertainty. I talked about trying to integrate tree information and look at graphs. And yesterday we talked about poor data quality and using probabilities and trying to avoid what I called information linkage. And today what I'll talk about is interpretability, which is really important in statistics. So there's no point in being right if you can't communicate to your biologist. They won't publish what you tell them. So you have to have an order of correction, which is just right for their level of understanding, and that's very difficult. Um, and I've had many cases where I just did the perfect method and it may, never made it into the paper. And so I'll talk about some methods which I think have a chance of making it into papers. And also, the big challenge in statistics and arguments that we're all having have to do with reproducibility and replicability of our results, and we worry about that. So first of all, I'll talk about PARS and thinking about heterogeneous systems. And mostly, here you have a bimodal distribution, and it's because there's a hidden variable. And a lot of what I'll talk about is trying to find those hidden variables. And yesterday, I talked about mixtures. And we're going to come back to mixtures. Because in fact, if you have a trimodal distribution like this one, it's in fact that there's a hidden layer with a category, what we call a categorical variable or a factor, which you haven't measured, but which is actually causing this um, mixture to occur. And you have to think in layers. I'd encourage you to think in layers even more so today because there's a very popular um, series of methods, especially in Canada, um, deep learning is a big thing, and if you ask yourself why are deep learning methods so um, effective, a lot has to do with layers there too, and in some sense you have these compositions of functions, and some of those functions are sort of dummy variables, um, indicator variables for certain regions, and so they are trying to do a little bit the same as what we do when we do these hidden layers, but we're more sort of explicit about it. Now, we can have also an infinite mixture, and we saw the example of the gamma poisson, and in statistics, infinite starts at n if you have a, a sample size n. Um, if you have more parameters than that, then it's infinite. So I have a friend who lives not very far, and he had a newspaper article about him not so long ago, and they called him the Yoda of Silicon Valley. And uh, one of his m most well-known saying is, premature optimization is the root of all evil in coding. And I would say that premature summarization is the re root of all evil in statistics. That is, if you summarize very high-dimensional complex phenomena to one zero-dimensional number, you're in for trouble, and that's what's that's what bugging today's statistics. That is, you have the pretense of taking this really heterogeneous system and saying, oh, I have this one number that summarizes all, and that number might also be a measurement of diversity, alpha diversity, or so on. There are all kinds of numbers that statisticians like. Each area has their own, and they're all evil. So you don't want to be using just numbers, and we need to summarize in different ways. And I, I said in my first lecture, one of the things that we try to do very um, carefully is to decompose 
what we know from the data, so we have observed data, which is X, and then we have parameters, and we're trying to make inference about the parameters. And we're going to be in cases here where the parameters I'm interested in are vectors um, that sum to one. So we have the distribution on the simplex. And we suppose that we have, say, J taxa, and I called them ASVs yesterday, and you saw why. But you have a certain number of species, and you're trying to look at, um, I make inferences about the true incidence of those species in certain specimens. And in particular, if you have a whole set of specimens that have been treated and a whole set which, haven't been, which are a control, you might want to look at the difference between those vectors and give some uncertainty quantification. So that's sort of re-saying some of the things I already said. But in my world, it's a world where I, say, I like to say ecology has to meet the clinic. So there's ecological statistics, and we have clinical statistics, and we have to meet somewhere. And we have to meet because they're going to be clinical trials and we have to have real quantification of uncertainty. We don't want to just say, oh, we have you know, qualitative. There's the existence of this community and it's very qualitative. So we have to be quantitative and that's why I like to think of it that way. So I'm going to start, and you know, those of you who are real statisticians, I'm sorry. I'm starting um, from the beginning of the story because I need something called the Dirichlet. And so the, um, when you have balls in boxes here, I have four boxes. They're unequal. And so they have unequal probabilities. And the probability of a ball falling into the box is, you know, say, proportional to the size of the box. Um, that's the multinomial with four, bo four um, probabilities. But um, I want to actually make inferences on different multinomials. And so we use something called the Dirichlet. And now I'm going to tell you a teaching story. So I teach a lot of introductory probability, and we teach often in section. And there's something called the birthday problem. Everybody knows the birthday problem. How many people do you have to have in the room to have a 50-50 chance of a match? How many? Yes. Actually, you're wrong. But, <laughs> but that's the good answer, right? <laughs> but in a class... I said in a class. So what happened was, over the years, I would do it in sections and things like that. And in particular, when I was at MIT, we had sections of about 25 students. And it always seemed to work. And there was something wrong about that. It wasn't always supposed to work. And it's sort of very embarrassing when it doesn't work, because you sit around, you ask the students to name off their birthdays, and you already spent 10 minutes, and nothing happens. And that's embarrassing. So I really wanted to know, you know, 50-50, is it that you only need you know, less than 23 students? And what happens 25 in general? Is it? And so there's some information that you have actually when you do it in a class. So what information do you have? So the students are pr practically all from the same year. Okay. So what? That's... So I'm going to be a Bayesian about this. So I have some prior information that I am then going to use. So eh, it's not a lot of information, but it's some information. The next piece of information is this is being done in the US. And doctors don't like to work on weekends. They have lots of drugs at their disposition. And C-sections and things like that get programmed. So in fact, there are much less children born on weekends than there are on weekdays. So there's an actual ratio, and that's, we have a lot of data on that. So already we have some prior information that we could use, and we can ask, you know, does it make a difference? Um, and so I wrote a paper, because, um, you know, I like to write papers, and, uh, uh, with my husband, Percy Diaconis, and we wrote this in Sankhya. And we went through really all the standard probability problems in Fella, and we just said we're being Bayesians about this. And we're going to change the original probability where you say every day of the year is equally likely, one out of three and 65. And we're going to put P1, P2, P365. We're going to put a measure on that. We're going to put, make those vary 
according to a distribution, which is going to be a distribution on the simplex, so all those numbers sum to one, and that simplex, um, you know, that distribution, well, the standard prior is called the Dirichlet, and it's a generalization of the di distribution that we use on probabilities of success, which is the beta distribution. And so the Dirichlet is, is a good distribution, and then if you take in the Dirichlet, um, it has a parameter, which is a vector of length, the number of uh, boxes, and then it's proportional to um, here, you know, the, the probabilities here, x1 to a, a1 minus 1, and so on. And if you take a equals to 1, then you get the uniform prior on the whole simplex. And that's a continuous prior. That's not, you know, probability 1 over uh, 365. The probability 1 over 365 is a point mass where all the probabilities are equal. And so, in some sense, the Dirichlet allows you to create a continuum between those two, the, 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 the complete uniform and the point mass. So that, it, as I said, it was a two-dimensional version of the. Uh, um, it's a n-dimensional version of the two-dimensional one, and you can interpolate between the, the two types. And so, just to show you what you get if, with the different numbers, as I said, the probability is all equal. That's the standard computation, and it's 22.9, 23. And if you took a prior which is just uniform prior, you get about 16. So you only need 16 students in the room to have a 50-50 chance. So it changes the probability somewhat, and it makes it more likely. So it makes size more likely. And then we wanted to go a little bit further, and I'm not going to go into too many of the details, but we assigned, we looked at some data on the ratio um, of about 70% um, if you had, you know, if 100% was during the weekday, 70% was what you had on weekends. And if you use that and not, it doesn't really matter what the weight you put on that, you get always around 16. So it's almost like the uniform. So that's a sort of little exercise in um, how would you use a Bayesian prior week part of information in order to do a standard probability calculation. And you saw that the, the key to that was this distribution on the simplex, which is the Dirichlet. And that's what going, we're going to use. So the, you, you, it, the Dirichlet has the effect that some of the p's are going to be much higher, so it'll make a probability of a match at that value much, much higher. On the other side, um, and I won't talk to you about it um, now, but it does terrible things if you're trying to make a full collection. So if you want a full collection of baseball cards, that's the most, or coupon collector's problem, that's a well-known, you know, you need uh, uh, about 2,000, but with, if it's all equally likely. But as the baseball or magic card vendors know, um, you need it more than 100,000 or 150,000 if you have very, very unequal probabilities. So in the case of this type of Dirichlet, you need a lot. And that actually served me well because I was trying to do a study of TB and we wanted to collect 90% uh, of the strains. And the strains of, were of very unequal probabilities. And that computation actually applies to real-world problems pretty well. So that's... A, now I'm going to come back to the multinomial, and um, th there is a problem there. So in the multinomial, once you've decided what the probabilities are in the boxes, you're throwing your balls in, but the, um, and you, you decide that you know, you're throwing 100 balls into all of your boxes, the number of balls that um, occur in, say, box two and box four are independent up to, you know, one over n, about one over n. And if you have a number, a large number of boxes, they're practically independent. And so it doesn't work for biology. Because in biology, we have these phenomena of um, codependent bacteria. So there are some bacteria which only occur if this other bacteria occur. And then we also have it, and we saw it for the pregnancy data, if you had lactobacillus, you have a much, much lower probability of having Gardnerella. 
So they're also exclusive. And so you have these high correlations in the, in the, in, in the boxes or in the taxa, in the species, which precludes this nice Dirichlet, which I just told you about. So we can't use a standard Dirichlet mixture type model in the real setting of um, the microbiome. So this, this was a huge problem. Um, and the, these are the real, I, I talked a lot to biologists and I wanted them, okay, are you sure this is true that you have these things? And they gave me, here's an example, here's another example. So you have some biological examples where these can't exist um, without each other. And, um, and, and so this is really, this is something to take into account when you're trying to make a real model, you have to really pay attention to the details. So we need multivariate dependencies, so the standard um, Dirichlet is not going to work. And we saw yesterday, and I just to remind you a little bit of this, that we had these um, communities that we were able to define in the case of the uh, preterm birth prediction. Um, you know, we had uh, community four was very, very different than all the others, and we obtained a lot of power by restricting ourselves within that community because everything well, is different within each of the communities. So again, this is the case where you have underlying categorical variable which helps you make things more homogeneous. So these hidden communities, um, they enabled you to do this decomposition of variability where you start off by saying, well, there's this type and that type, and then within this we have these d two different behaviors. And again, it's hierarchical, so you have many layers. So we had a conclusion. We were able to conclude on the, on the existence in the Gardnerella as a biomarker. And now I want to generalize that study. Um, if suppose you didn't have simple communities, but they were more complex. And I started thinking about this problem with, um, with one of my PhD students who now works with Joshua Bengio. Um, his name is Chris Sankaran. And he and I uh, really like what... Uh, David Bly wrote several papers about something called latent Dirichlet analysis. And it, it's used not at all for ecology. It's used for text analysis. But it's a very clever idea. And we were inspired in some sense because when we made plots like this, and I showed you how we make it, it's very unsatisfactory to actually know what's going on here. And so we don't know which species are assembling with each other and what are the dynamics. We'd like a much uh, clearer picture. So we took the same data and we applied this latent Dirichlet to it. And um, I'll just show you a little bit how it works. So the idea in, in um, textual analysis is, say you scrape a whole bunch of websites and, or you look at some documents. So you look at the websites and you don't know you know, what they're about or anything. And you do a text analysis, so there's a whole bunch of words. And the words um, can be connected in some sense to terms, a, a little bit more general, so they're variants on the same um, term. And then these terms will indicate by their frequencies which are the most likely topics that this page is about. And the big difference in um, this analysis to, say, clustering is one page can have several topics. So you might have a lot of legal terminology and a lot of sports terminology, and that page might be about contracts in sports or something. So you have a combination of topics. Um, so we made the parallel where you have, instead of a corpus of text, you have a whole human body or the whole environment. Instead of words, you have the reads. Um, instead of topics, we're going to have different communities um, at, which assemble together in, in certain ways. And the terms are the species, the taxa themselves, and the document, which is the main element that we analyze, is the specimen. The, we call that the sample. We don't mean a sample in a statistical term. It's the, the, the sample from a biological viewpoint. So, so, so you, we make this parallel, and this enables us to analyze the data um, with that type of model. 
So here, um, here's a Pride and Prejudice. So you have the book. That's like a little bit like the subject. And then you have an index, so you have a page. For us, we had time for the longitudinal data. And then you have the frequencies. Now, of course, we have many more zeros and some rather large numbers, but it doesn't matter. The model, it still works very well. Why does it work so well? What's the, what's the catch? Where, where does it come to? It turns out that when you uh, use a, make a sentence, you have many choices of words to say the same thing. There's a lot of synonymous. And one of the things that's really hard in the microbiome is in some com you, you have the same types of communities, but you actually don't have the same taxa that are fulfilling the same role. So you might have a choice of several different synonymous taxa which are fulfilling the same role. And, and that is, is very hard to get at. Um, in, in, a, in a standard way. And this works beautifully because in language it's exactly the same thing. And so as long as you have enough data, so lots of reads, um, you can um, see that, you know, the co-assembly of certain taxa, and if there are these two, a lot of the time they could be replaced by these two or these three, and you see these situations where you, you have this assembly. So it's quite a nice um, framework and, and then um, it turns out that this is actually very similar, practically the same, to the mixed membership model across topics that was done by Peter Donnelly and Jonathan Richard, uh, Pritchard and uh, Matthew Stevens uh, <clears throat> in their structure type decomposition. Now, it's a case that, you know, I was using Leighton Dirichlet, and I didn't, and I know all about structure, and I'd never made the parallel, and I gave a talk, and Peter Donnelly was there, and he said, oh, you know, that's the same as, the, oh, yes, sorry, I didn't realize. But, <clears throat> and then, of course, we set it up as a Bayesian method, so we can look at the posterior distributions and the confidence regions or confidence intervals. And, but the, ma the main idea there is the observed microbiomes becomes mixtures of community types. And you can see in the dynamics of that, it's sort of, you can see the community types move over. You can see them change, and, um, uh, and you can see the different topics. So this is the model. So the X is always the data for me. And then here, we're actually going to have two Dirichlet, so it's a dual we have this duality in some sense between, you know, there's randomness in the two levels. Um, there's randomness on the topics and there's randomness on the specimens. And, um, and so we like to think of this somewhat as being hierarchical. And I have this image of Bayesian statistics for me is turtles all the way down. It just depends on where you start. That is, you have the data and you're going to have a generating process which has parameters, and those parameters can be considered to be random, so they can have distributions with parameters who have more parameters. And so it's just up to you where you decide to stop, but you could go on. And uh, everything is random in Bayesian statistics. So we think of it as a gener generative model. Um, I think that's the simplest way. And so you think of them. Um, a distribution of taxa in a specimen by saying you randomly choose um, a distribution over communities or topics. And this is a distribution over distributions in some sense. So this is definitely going to be Dirichlet. And then we generate words and taxa from the, sp from the specimen. So for that particular specimen, and again, we randomly choose a community type from our distribution of topics, and then we choose that community type has a distribution of words or taxa, which is associated to it, and then you generate from that one. So it's a sort of two-level generative model, and as I said, it is dual because we're doing it both you know, in samples, and there's a hidden layer here for the taxa for beta. And then you know, the document or the specimen and then the communities, you have to decide. That's a number that you might change. That is, 
It might be that you think that 10 communities is enough, and then you turn up, but you find that that's not necessary. It's a little bit like the clustering parameter. You usually take a little bit more, and then you see some of them are empty most of the time. It doesn't fill in. Um, you take less. And so this is the model itself. And um, so we have a mixed membership model, and then you have these different community types who have distri different distributions over taxa. And then we have a distribution of those. And then the observations that come out are a mixture of those. And so um, for each of the observations, they come from one topic or the other. And that assembles in some sense. And this is the representation of the antibiotic perturbation experiment. And so just to tell you, we put the data into Leighton de Richelieu without telling the program about um, the time. So every sample was its own sample. And um, the, you know, the, uh, the different trends within these became different topics. And the dependency is something that was inherent in the data. So um, you see the, before the antibiotic, this is the first course of antibiotics. Between the two courses of antibiotics, there's a second course of antibiotics, so post. And so we're looking at topics or communities who behave in different ways. And we see that you know, the first topic here, it doesn't start to change until about three days after the antibiotic synthesis, and then it changes a lot. And then it takes a quite a bit. Um, to get back to where it was. And then this time it goes down, but it goes up much quicker. Okay, so this is a, a, a case of resilience. Um, and so that's a, a first sort of behavior of um, a community of bacteria doing that way. And I'll show you in a minute which ones were involved. And here, these ones were sort of the lower, they weren't so prevalent. And um, they go down very quickly, but they have a very different behavior at the second time course. They go up during the second, just after the second time course. And then, you know, a third topic. And so we have a certain number of topics, and we, they have weights or frequencies as to how prevalent they were, and they've been ordered by the most important, the second most important. And then we can look within the topic at the different species and their abundances. And here, they haven't been ordered by time. They've been ordered along the phylogenetic tree. So we, we made a phylogenetic tree, and we have the different families. Here, you have ruminococci. Uh, and they're all on the right here. And then, you know, small, small families here. And this is the largest number. And the bacteroides are just up here. And so you can see within the topics, and much easier for the biologist to interpret this than just looking at the ordination plot. And then we also um, made uh, a couple of typical time course. You show the time course of how individual bacteria from within each of the topics are behaving. So you can understand. So here, of course, this is the topic where you had this drop just after the antibiotics. And you see they're representative from almost all the families in that. And so almost all the families are affected. Um, and then uh, in, the, in the third topic, for instance, they're much less which are affected. You have much more. Uh, um, of the ruminococcus in the, in the topic two. Yeah? So I'm just curious, I'm asking sort of a parallel to the structure. Do you have to specify the number of topics here? Yeah, well, it's what I said. We give a slightly bigger number yeah. and then just uh, scale it down. It's like clustering yeah. and things like that. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and I'm sorry I don't do it in the language of, of, for me, it was all in the language of text analysis. And the parallel was because of the spelling in data too. You know, because I said, oh, that's like words. And then I got, you know, we got carried away. And we say, oh, this is just like words. And this is, you know, we got, yeah. I guess there's a question. Do you group them into topics using all the data or only using the pre-treatment data? No, we, we used all the data, all the samples, right. Right, right, right. Yeah. Do you ever try to fit it with 
different numbers of topics? Yeah, we did. We did. And, 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 and it's very stable. You, we, the, the topics at the end, the small topics, are just minimally interpretable. I mean, it's like in PCA. You could keep more top, more dimensions if you think there's some small thing that might be interpretable. So you want to keep everything in case you miss something. But you wouldn't do more than you know, four or five topics. It's, it depends how many community types you think you're in presence of. But it's not a, it's really not, I mean, you could do a whole Bayesian method where you have a prior on the number of topics. It doesn't add a lot. It's much better to do it by hand, but you could do a prior. Um, on the diversity, really on the diversity. So it turns out, um, I put this slide here for Jonathan, because uh, we were talking, and he was saying, well, we kind of like non-negative -ne matrix factorization. Sorry, I have a typo. And they're, they're, I wanted to look, because I'd seen some literature, they're very linked, they're very similar. So it's a certain type of latent Dirichlet, but a different um, loss function. They use kullback liebler divergent, and then it's an approximation of LDA. But it's interesting, because they're, 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 they're similar, and you can show that. And it's also very related to a Bayesian. So here... Um, I wrote it down in some sense almost like uh, a generalization of clustering. And you can write it down also as a generalization of factor analysis, Bayesian factor analysis. And we'd already done the work on Bayesian factor analysis. And then I realized, oh, it's kind of the other way of doing it. But, um, and so that, that, that is sort of interesting. But all of those methods are very, very close together, actually. And uh, so I, I'm not saying, you know, anything is new. And as I say, you know, this is the Bayesian factor analysis that we did in JASA. Well, I was showing you we wanted to register. But this is actually a full Bayesian non-parametric model. The big difference for us when we were doing that paper was, so I said we have multinomial with a finite number of ASVs. And actually, I was... I really wanted a model which was like the, the infinite allele model where you have infinite n number of possible um, boxes. And so in that case, you need to use a Gaussian process representation because in real situations in the microbiome, you have this evolutionary phenomena where actually your, your, your bacteria are not staying the same. So you have new ones which are being created. So you can't say in going in, I know I have 1,500, and that's all, because you want the potential of having more. So we wanted an infinite dimensional model, and that's, where this is, this is, that's what it does. But in some sense, the uh, topics uh, here, we have um, very, very similar um, topic type construction and um, with correlations between the using cosine, and we use a kernel to build from this um, Gaussian process type model. Um, and then we have these inner products, and, um, and, and it gives something which is, which is quite similar. And I'm not going to do the details because it's, but again, um, the plot that you get is very nice because if you look in here, you have some which are quite unknown among the projections. And that, if you go in, you find those are the ones that had very low sequencing depth. So that makes a lot of sense biologically. So it's pleasing to have a, a system, uh, a way of doing that um, in the projection. Now I want to talk to you about the problem of reproducibility and p-values and statisticians are beating their hearts out because we think that we're going to be made redundant by this fact that no journals are going to be expect, you know, accepting p-values anymore. And so what are we going to do for a living? And I'm going to talk about um, a, a paper which appeared in Nature uh, which I was very interested in, which is called the Enterotype paper. And it was actually a paper about clustering in some sense because it said that in the human gut, um, if you look at the bacteria, they can be clustered. These are samples from different people. And you have the Japanese here, the Spanish, but you also have Japanese in the other groups. You have some French, Italian, 
German, Spanish, have some Spanish and Japanese up there, so it's not geographical. But the paper, the, the, the media picked up this paper and said, um, your gut is like your blood, you belong to a type. And I just, you know, this is absolute rubbish. So what, what we did was then we try, and I'm going to see if I can do this. Um, I'm going to show you what we did. We got the data. And then we did some forensics on what was going on and how did they analyze the data. So how did they make this plot? And so we started by looking, and the first thing that happens is if there were species that were missing their annotation, they were given the, the number minus one, and then everything else was made to sum, everything was made to sum to one including the minus one. So sometimes the minus one was 0.4 and sometimes it was 0.53 and something such. So the one is not, I mean, it contains, anyway. Okay, I see people are nodding, so you see that's a problem. Then they dropped actually nine observations out of 41, for which they didn't, you know, they were dropped out of the data set. And then they did ordination. So I did some ordinations with the, Missing data just to see, you know, what was going on, whether I could figure out why. First of all, they used a very funny distance. So I said, you know, find the right distance and you find the right result. Well, they used a distance, the Jensen-Shannon distance is very well known for being very polarizing. So if you want to make the data look very clustered, in the old days you used Jensen-Shannon, nowadays you use something called t -SNE. But it does the same thing. It separates everything out so they look very nice and clustered. And this is non-metric, multidimensional scaling. This is correspondence analysis. This is Bray Curtis. Um, there's actually a difficulty here as you want to know which distance should I choose. So you can loop in R through all the distances and see if you see any structure. And you could also use a different clustering variable, which in this case is technology, which definitely shows us three clear clusters, which probably is the history of where the clusters came from to start with. And then you have optimal number of clusters, and there's a Kalinsky Harabas is a standard one, and here it says four. If you use a gap statistic, it probably says two. Then I tried doing the actual ordination that they have in the paper, and I couldn't get exactly the same picture. I have slightly more variance. I have the switch between the left and the right, which I said eigenvectors are, you know, not invariant and against left and right, and that didn't bother me. But here, my group one, which is this one, is sort of fatter, and my group two and three is fatter. Then I wondered what they did. But in fact, what they did was they clustered the data. They gave the clusters label one, two, and three, and then they did a linear discriminant analysis and plotted that. This is a nature paper. And so I always do this example, telling my students, you're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do you know, data mining and then doing on the same data you know, a supervised method. But that's what they did. So I made it look pretty good, um, nice and clustered. But as I say, I would say it's a horseshoe. You look at that data. And actually, when we have much, much denser plots, we get a horseshoe. Now, why did I show you that? That's sort of forensic, and we have all the code up, and you can, you can look at it. But what I was interested, really, is the following problem. Summary of the choices that were made during that study. First of all, you have to choose the data transformation. Here they took proportions, so they took out some of the rare taxa. But I like regularized log or arc sign hyperbolic. Um, but you could do subsampling, rarifying, or you could take proportions, or you could take the original data. You could take a subset, so they dropped nine, but you could have dropped one or two or three or so. You filter out certain taxa. You choose a distance. I showed you you have 40 choices in vegan. You choose an ordination method, so either PCOA, a non-metric one, or there are other ordination methods. You choose a clustering method. You choose a number of clusters. You choose it. So when you've done that, it's nice combinatorics. You get 204 million. And I promise you, post-selective inference won't help. You, you can, and this is why, as a statistician, over the years, when I started my job at Stanford, I wanted to please everybody. I could always get a significant p-value. I'm very good at it. 
Um, because you have a lot of choices involved, and as soon as you've got a lot of choices, you can sort of say, nah, I don't like those two points, and you know, this is sort of, well, this metric does a better job at what you want to see, and so on. So it's all crazy. The only thing that you can do, which is valid, and this is what we do systematically, is you publish what you, your analysis. And then somebody can go in with your code, if you, you know, clean it up, and they can make a change. I'll change my choice of distance. I'll change, you know, my threshold. And if the results are pretty robust to the changes, then it's there. So it's a robustness question. How sensitive are you to have a, having found that little sweet spot? And it's the only way to do it. That is, as statisticians, it's our responsibility to do what the mathematicians have been doing all along, along show your work. You have a proof, you write it out. And nobody, once everybody's verified the proof, nobody has to revisit. It's, you know, the, 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 it's reproducible and it can serve for later on. And this is the same. That is, people can build on your code, on your method of doing things, and we'd make progress much faster instead of arguing about, you know, the kind of things that, as a reviewer, I have to argue with my, uh, you know, the people you review for is very difficult. So I have a whole bunch of, you know, supplements, so in my web page, but also I think it's very important that we publish the data and all the code so that people can move forward from where you published and not have to start from scratch. And so we always publish supplementary material. And I do want to make a plug here for something which has worked very well at Stanford and could save um, your libraries for you. So at Stanford, we've encouraged something called the digital repository. And the libraries serve because they're the archives. That is, if I move my lab or I retire, my web page will go down. But, and so I can't put my code and all of that, maybe not on GitHub. GitHub now belongs to Microsoft. So you know what's going to happen next. Um, so you want somewhere absolutely permanent. So something called a permanent URL is something that the library promises and certifies will be permanent. So we have a permanent archive of your data. And then we get into the nitty gritty of if you want to have the version that runs as it ran for me, so it was rep you probably need to use something like Docker or Binder or some tools that make it so that you don't also have to have the old version of the software from two years ago when you wrote the program. So that, that, that's something. But it's still... It's not perfect, but it's much better. People should stop saying, oh, I can't do it because we don't have the perfect system. Okay? And I love this expression of um, I.J. Good, who always used to say, I don't want it perfect, I want it Thursday. And, you know, it, it's just like, let's do what we can, show good faith, be transparent, and then move on and not say, oh, we can't do it because it's not perfect. And so here are some of the resources that we've developed. So I talked a lot about hydro heterogeneous data, and PhiloSeq is my, you know, the, one of the earlier programs, and Data2 is the one that allows you to see um, all the different um, error. It's an interactive program that lets you denoise the data but also see the error. And I believe in interacting with the data. I don't believe in batch, so you should be looking at things. And then we have the tree lapse, which allows you to look at trees and longitudinal data that Chris wrote. And the program about the uh, latent variable uh, is this microbiome PVLM. And we have it as a Docker um, to make it easier. And we have adaptive GCPA, which allows you to modulate a tree and a bootstrap um, boot long. So I talked about those things, and I wanted to put them on a slide so that you'd have at least the information. And as I said, the book I wrote is online freely. And I just want to finish off with um, a few things that I, I think that um, I wanted to say distances are useful, and I cut it off but you need the right one. We use probabilities and percolate uncertainty. We solve the problem of heterogeneity with multi-component objects, and we can incorporate trees and graphs. 
Um, we know how to do interpretation with this latent variable or hierarchical type models, which I think are very useful. And then reproducible, just be transparent. And if somebody says, you know, it's actually very liberating. All the postdocs I work with um, are always very worried about how do I do it right? Well, you have a lot of choices, and there are lot, many of them are completely reasonable in statistics. You have many choices. If you document them and you say what you did, you're honest about it, it's okay. You don't have to have the one value, you know, the, 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 you ha you, it doesn't have to be that there's only one possible analysis. And when I was in France, we used to have this competition between the French and the English. We had a data set, and we would get together, and we would analyze it in two completely different ways. And, you know, we often came to very similar conclusions. There's not just, it's not, there are different ways of analyzing the data, but if you're transparent about it, people can then say, oh, I see, that makes sense. She did this kind of centering and that kind of normalization. You know, maybe I should try that. And, um, but, and it's also, you can say, okay, you, I don't have to oscillate between, should I do this or this? Well, try both. You put the code for both. Okay, so there's current, um, the open problems and current work that we have um, is... A lot of models and hierarchical models, we tend to give them, make them richer and richer. And then we are running MCMC in various um, STAN and things like that. And I think a big problem is what we call non-identifiability, where if you change something at several layers, um, you have several knobs, you could get actually the same thing. And there's not very much theoretical work um, on that, and that's something that we do worry about. And also nonlinearity, and so we, I told you we had this mixture between additive and multiplicative data. We try to make it so that we back to the world of GLMs or linear models and things like that, but I have to be honest, that doesn't always work out that way, but the, doing it hierarchically and breaking it into pieces can help, but there actually um, still quite a lot of work to be done. So I benefit from a huge number of tools and things that have been developed by, in particular, Rob Gentleman um, and Hadley Wickham. JJ Allaire runs our studio. I can't understand his business model because he gives everything away and has a whole team of people working on our studio, but it is great. I'm very thankful. And my co-author, Wolfgang Huber, on the book. And Joey McMurdy does PhiloSeq on the weekend. And Ben Callahan just started a, a, a postdoc um, uh, as an assistant professor in North Carolina State and continues to work with the group. And I'm thankful to all my collaborators and mainly um, Dan David Relman, with whom I've done most of the microbiome work I, I presented, and um, most of my group members. So thank you for having me. Yes. I have a comment and a question, actually. So my comment is thank you very much for having me here happy days. And thank you for all the tools that you developed. They've been right. transformative, like really, um, and all the transparency, all the work has been extremely yeah. helpful. A lot of people complain. I mean, the NIH and the NSF won't fund my work because I'm not a computer scientist. So, you know, and they don't like R, basically. No. But, but still, the statisticians think that we know how to make... LaTeX was made by Don Knuth for mathematicians. It was written in a math way. And the ph philosophy behind R is a little bit like that. That is, it's you know, made for... We want to make it easy for ourselves, and maybe we, we break all the rules. And, um, but we seem to be able to... Maybe we have to rewrite everything in Julia. Some uh, you told me I now have to do everything. <laughs> yeah. So, um, in the, and this will be a naive nice question because I'm not. I, I don't really understand exactly what Jerzy is doing. So, the yeah. paper you had on the, the antibiotic treatment with the um, like four or five types on. So, maybe it already does this, or maybe the question is: Is it possible to? handle the uh, dependency of the data on each other. So if one factor is going up, then by definition others are going down. And yes. in a biological way, in a data way. So I'm curious yeah, yeah, yeah. But, so we separate that. 
And it takes into account the document um, size, so the documents are all very different sizes. And I think it's helpful to think of it in terms of documents, because you can sort of see what's happening. You look at different books, and there are different themes in the book. But the, along the, the chapters, the themes might change in a sort of continuous way, and you might be moving from one theme in the book to another theme. And it's a little bit what happens in the longitudinal analysis. So I showed you the vanilla Leighton Dirichlet, and there's been wonderful progress by um, David Bly and other people doing more sophisticated Dirichlet. So I made, I, the vanilla Dirichlet um, makes topics which are independent. So every sample can have several components. So it's not, the samples are no longer classified, either I belong to this topic or that topic, but I could be 25% of that topic and 75. But the topics themselves are considered to be independent. There's a more sophisticated method where you say, if I see this topic, I'm much more likely to see this other topic. Mm -hmm. So that I didn't talk about because it's more complicated, but it's definitely, once you get a foot into the topic analysis, Leighton Dirichlet, you realize, oh, there's somebody who did this really clever thing which applies. I just think it's a useful way of thinking about it, mm -hmm. um, simplifying. And one of the main reasons is because we have this problem where very different bacteria fulfill the same role. And it even goes to the metagenomics where you have um, the bacteria, you don't really care about the bacteria, it's the genes that are coming in and they're fulfilling different roles. Same. I left you too much time for questions. Mm -hmm. I, I thought I, <laughs> I would be. <laughs> Go ahead. It's a bit silly, and I can point it out just by looking at the documentation of the package, but um, do the, do the latent Jerusalem models allow for hierarchical modeling, like random effects and stuff like that? Well, then you have to do something uh, in, to try to explain or interpret the topics. So in the topics, there are assemblies, probability distributions of bacteria. And you could ask, you know, which of the, so what the, what the function of the bacteria might be. And so there's a, there's a whole other layer that you might need to do in order to understand what's going on. Oh, I see. So this just gives you the topics and their contributions yeah. to the samples, and then you can do whatever you want yeah. with that. Right. Uh, yeah. Just to follow up, but aren't you entering danger zone if you try to overinterpret topics? Well, I think you want to have simple interpretations of the presence and absence of the, as the topics move. I mean, overinterpret. It's the same as in PCA or something like that. You can't just say, oh, this is this dimension. It's very, very useful to say this is a size dimension. It's much more, or this is a, this is a. So when I said, you know, this is a topic where um, you have the fall after the three days, and then, but in the second um, course of antibiotics, you have a certain amount of resilience, so you don't go down again. And that's very useful because then you can ask, oh. Oh, this patient has all of this topic, topic one, and um, then this is a resilient patient. So that's a lot of information, because that's actually what we were after. Um, the, 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 and we were very happy to have that first topic um, be at the top, because it showed that the main um, thing that's going on is this resilience. And that's very important. That's why we did the follow-up study. We found that there, some patients um, react uh, well at the second course, and some don't at all. And so the the, the course of antibiotics um, at the second the second course is where we're actually most interested in what happens when we retake them. So yes, I think we maybe we overinterpret, but that's what we're doing it for. I mean, it's. It's an interpretation tool where we're trying to simplify and not be wedded to, and I think this is the big problem people have, they want to say, oh, I find this one bacteria which seems to be more significant 
completely abundant in these two conditions. And that doesn't work. It, worked for, it works for gene expression. It works for other situations. But here, what happens is that bacteria, its role will be played by other bacteria. And so you can't do that. Um, so you, but you could predefine once you found the topics. You could then say, OK, now I'm going to register. These are the topics that I want to study in my follow-up study. I'm going to look at that topic. And you define it. So. Any question? Uh, so, on the topic of reproducible research, yeah. which is what many of us have been trying to promote really strongly, uh, especially in the last few years, I'm just curious about, about a couple of things. First of all, about with you, your interactions with scientists, biologists especially, do you find uh, pushback about. Yes, uh, but then I stop working with them. <laughs> <laughs> they only push back once. <laughs> So um, the reason I work with David Relman is he understands that we are going to publish less papers. So we publish less papers. Our papers are much more cited because people use our code. And they say, oh, I like this part. And, I, and so, so we have, it's different. It, it's a question of, do you want to have you know, 50 papers, and which in the microbiome world is... You know, that's what people are doing, 50 papers a year. Or do you want to have only five or six and then, you know, a complete analysis? So we did the oral microbiome, and it was five years. And uh, we had a, I had a very dedicated student. She had to learn all of spatial statistics and a whole, you know, and, but, but, and her code, her script is, you know, broken up into pieces, and it's hugely useful. You know, it's a, it's a script of what you should do and how you could use it. And she found a job straight away. Um, she's working at the NIH. Because that's what people want to be doing now. And maybe it wasn't so bad that she only had two papers. But she had this thing which people felt as if that's where we should go. And I understand the, the pressure to publish and the number of papers seems to be very important. But I, I learned this from the mathematicians. The mathematicians, you don't have to have... Uh, if you look at Richard Taylor, how many papers he has, he doesn't have a lot of papers. But, you know, each paper is a, a year or two's work, and then it's very thorough and everything, and then, then people don't have to re-derive everything. So it, it's a little bit more, at least let's move more towards the mathematicians who show their work. Um, Sorry, so another aspect of it that I try to promote that I, I imagine you do too is that it's also easier to reproduce your own work. If you go oh yeah. So your so your favorite your favorite collaborator is you six months ago, right? Yeah. right. right. And, but so I wonder though whether you well, you know it's become very popular now. Ten years, fifteen years ago, all of us may have been trying to do our best, but weren't the standard of reproducibility wasn't there. Do you find yourself going back and creating our packages related to? older ideas and... Well, we're extending them all. You, often you give it as a, to a student as a project. You know, I really like this. We'd like to revisit it with all the new things that we know, and we, we do that mm -hmm. and things like that. It's certainly the case. But it's a way... Th th the reason I teach biologists so intently is I want to be able to collaborate with people who can understand the code I send back and forth. So we collaborate in terms of our, our code and then as we're going along we're sort of preparing the supplementary material. And, uh, and it's very easy for instance not to feel worried about a choice because in the supplementary material you show you know, here are the t 10 different other choices and here's all the code and what you would have gotten. So, or uh, people sometimes call this the multiverse, and I call it, you know, the branching paths, all the different things you could have done. But, um, yes. So, um, sort of following with David's idea and yours, and, and so, like Ben, I serve as I serve as editor at a you know, biologically oriented journal for fairly quantitative people. Right. Um, but often, when you're interacting with biologists, um, they're doing the analysis themselves. They don't have either they have no opportunity to work with statisticians mm -hmm. or choose not to or whatever. Yeah. And you know, I feel even in, in my relatively short lifetime as a faculty, we, we've only just actually gotten more moderate buy-in on the data side of things, getting them to actually say yes, you can get data. Yeah. And 
there's been even a sort of a header in chief level with a lot of the people saying that we definitely want them to further code, but let's be really, really gentle. I mean, you know, the, yes. the thought of trying to do Docker for a while, I mean, we just don't even talk about it. Like, yeah, 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 okay. So, I, it's actually not that bad. No, no, I agree. But <laughs> it's, it's the, the what needs to be learned and when they. No, but I agree with you about gentle. That's what I was saying about perfect. Right. I, I never, you know, it, it's not perfect. If it's some effort, it's like when you go to a foreign country and you make a fool of yourself by pretending that you're going to try and speak the language, you don't speak it all. You're making a small effort in the right direction. It's completely different than, than saying, oh, I'm not giving you my data and I can't, you know. But it's much worse. I mean, there are many places where they still say, and, you know, the code and the data can be obtained from the author by email. And, yeah, yeah. You know, there's still people doing that. Oh, there are. In many fields, are still. I mean, I've literally just had a conversation with a colleague in the biology department where they asked, "Where do I put my data and my code?" I've never had to do this before, and I was shocked. And yeah. Were so journal. Uh, I just, you know, I at, at the practical level when I'm trying to have authors get their code up, how far do I push before they go? That is just too much. And I'm going somewhere else. Like. Yeah. Right. Um, right, right. Although usually the paper is accepted by that point. You, you, Right. I'm just sort of wondering how you teach. Well, as an editor, very often uh, I send a first email usually saying, oh, there's something missing in the supplementary information. Could you please yeah. um, upload? You know, very, very naive. You know, and then you know, they say, oh, we forgot. You know, oh, oh really? <laughs> and then I, I usually send them, they send me a, I send them another, I send them an example. Not a, a paper of mine, but papers where there is, you know, and saying well, this is an example, but don't don't feel you have to use any particular program or anything. There's no constraint. I just want to know if they actually did use a program and did analyze the data. It shouldn't be so onerous. Oh, I, yeah. And we don't care. You know, we're not here to criticize. Uh, you know, the first proof can be as long as you like. Right. I think that's a good. So, way as bad as you want. I think that's a great way. Right. <laughs> Just to follow up on that, I mean, we're doing a review now on methods of calibrating the disease transmission models, and people often don't know what they do, right? And so you're saying, well, they it, can't remember. Right. They, they, they went through several steps, and some of them are by hand. And I mean, I, I think a big, I think a big advantage of reproducible research is, you know, the whole yeah. peer review science thing. That the first step of telling others what you did is you're supposed to know what you did, and that hasn't always been the same. So we're trying to move in the right. But the, the reason it, it's like that is that there was this slew of papers, in particular about uh, microarrays, but then also about other things where people realize, well, it was published, but nobody can reproduce this. This actually doesn't turn out to be true, and we're trying to develop. And, and then people are saying, well, how could that be? You know, uh, and uh, and so. And, and everybody's blaming the p-values, but it's not only the p-values. It's a much you know, bigger picture about transparency and also not having an environment which is so anti... Yeah. Biologists, compared to the mathematicians, they're horrible. <laughs> you know, how rude and, you know, they're, 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 com <laughs> they're competitive. They're, that's why you like being a mathematician, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what I mean. It, it, when I studied in biology, there were things that people would do. Never in the statistics or math community would they think of doing that. And uh, it's very shocking when you start. You think, how do you? So the, the mathematicians have a lot to teach, uh, and and maybe it just has to do with community. That is, it's much more supportive and much less competitive. Maybe also because you know there's not a you know the number of people who are going to read a nice math paper. It's quite small, so the, you know, the <laughs> what's in what's in play is not maybe so important. I don't know, but um, but there is something to be learned. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'd like to just thank Dr. Holmes one more time. <laughs> Had a good time. Thank you.